Good morning. How are you? It has just gone at 931 this Friday morning. I'm Lee Med. Welcome to this DG Chamber webinar, the first of what we are calling our uh, virtual business breakfasts. So I do hope you have indeed got your, uh, you've had your bacon roll, maybe your Weetabix, and you have your uh, cup of coffee, he says, uh, in hand there. Uh, it's, it's going to be a great morning. It truly is the, the first in a series of these events that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks with our MSPs and our MPs. Uh, it is your chance to ask questions, to, to hopefully get some answers to those questions as well throughout the course of the morning. If you do want to pose a question, it's very, very simple to do. You can either use the question and answer box, which is located uh, down there at the bottom of your screen, or you can email your questions over to me as well. I have four different screens open to the other side of me here. Uh, so uh, lee.med at dgchamber.co.uk is how you get in touch if you do have a question this morning. And our guest is ready to take your questions. Our guest knows a thing or two about this region. He also knows a thing or two about doing business in Dumfries and Galloway because he has been a, a businessman for many, many years uh, before he moved into government, both at a, a local level. He was a councillor from 2012. And then in 2016, he was elected to the Scottish government as a constituency MSP. Finlay Carson is the Scottish Conservative spokesman for the digital economy, animal welfare and biodiversity. He also sits on the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for the Scottish Parliament. Now, if we've done this right, I should be able to say, good morning, Finlay. Good morning, Lee. Nice to be with you this morning. Particularly nice to be, oh, well, I'm going to say nice to be inside. I've been inside for 14 weeks, um, but today I, I certainly have no regrets being inside. It's, uh, it's like a monsoon in Newton Stewart this morning. It certainly is. It's a, it's a wet and a, I believe it's a somewhat, people would say, dreek day uh, forecast for the rest of it. But uh, thank you very much for taking the time to, to do this with us. I know you've been very, very busy, not only over the past uh, few weeks, but you've, you've had a busy, busy almost four years since you were elected to, to the Scottish Parliament, haven't you? How's, how's the journey been for yourself up until this point? Yeah, well, there's, there's been a lot of things uh, have, have come towards us that we didn't expect over the last four years. Um, it's uh, culminated in uh, the, the last four months being something that nobody could ever have, have foreseen. It uh, has kicked a lot of uh, policies and plans uh, into touch, unfortunately, and we've had to, to, to revisit exactly how we're going to look at the economy uh, going forward. Uh, I, as, you, as you said, uh, I'm the, the Deputy Convener of the Environment, uh, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee uh, and, and the spokesman on climate change and, and COP26, which was supposed to be taking place in Glasgow uh, at the end of this year, which, as uh, you'll all be aware, has, has been cancelled. So, you know, the biggest piece of work that we were looking forward to was uh, a new climate change uh, bill, which uh, we passed, which set some of the, the most ambitious uh, climate targets uh, in the world. Uh, and we were looking to uh, uh, scrutinising and looking at the government's proposals and the policies that were going to deliver that. Uh, we are now uh, looking at a lot of these uh, bills that the Parliament are going to be bringing forward, the Good Food Nation Bill, uh, the, the Climate Change and the Climate Change Plan, uh, are all being uh, substantially uh, changed or, or, or kicked into touch, unfortunately. Um, but it's all going to form very much part of the, the recovery. Um, and, and instead of... Uh, climate change being a, a, a attachment, if you like, to, to the, the economic uh, forecast. We're looking at it being uh, pivotal to our, us moving forward and, and the investment and, and, and the work that businesses are going to have to do in the next uh, 12 to, to 18 months to get the, the economy back on its feet. And it is going to be a real journey to, to try and get the economy back on its feet over the, over the next, uh, you say 12 to 18 months, but many people have actually said it could be substantially longer depending on the, the economy of, of the region. And Dumfries and Galloway itself, uh, an interesting economy, let's be honest, of course, agriculture, hospitality, tourism, retail, uh, food and drink as well, all key to the economy here in Dumfries and Galloway, Finlay. I know you'll have seen uh, many businesses speak to yourself over the past few weeks about their concerns uh, moving forward. What, has there been uh, a common thread coming through? And, and what have you found has been the, the, the biggest cry for help uh, or for the biggest sector looking for help, perhaps? 
Oh, I don't. Uh, we've had hundreds of uh, inquiries starting right uh, at the beginning of March, really, uh, when it looked like uh, lockdown was coming. Um, there, there's not been any main theme. Uh, most of the, the inquiries we've been have are based around which uh, grant uh, schemes have been available. So we have, first of all, we had the, the non-domestic rate scheme, uh, and there was lots of issues around about uh, late registrations, incorrect registrations, and we, we did a lot of work with, with companies to ensure that the, the assessor had the right information. Um, so initially, that was the, the main uh, uh, thrust uh, of the inquiries. Um, fortunately, we, we, we had a very um, engaging uh, department that was looking after the rates, and, and we've worked very well with them over the, the last three, four months. Uh, and some businesses that weren't registered are, are now uh, on the, the assessor's list. Uh, and that's that's been a, a, a big challenge. Some of the, the other issues we've had is that the, the, the lack of flexibility within those schemes where the government have set out guidelines and, you know, the simplest of uh, discrepancies was resulting in some companies who on paper would appear to have been valid applicants were, were being rejected. Uh, you know, that could be because they're a subtenant or because they, the, uh, the, the, the where the, the business was run from was slightly different than uh, the, the scheme uh, would suggest. So there's, you know, th that, that was a, a, a big issue. We then uh, moved on to the pivotal grant scheme, which again allowed uh, some of those businesses that fell through the, the trap to, to apply again. And on, on the whole, uh, I think it's been handled fairly well by SOCI, uh, given that they're a, a very new organization and initially the staff uh, and, and even the, the chief exec of the organization were really looking at getting the, the organization on its feet, putting the policies and procedures in place to, to allow the, the organization to go forward in the, in the long term. But what faced them was, uh, you know, a, a huge number of uh, companies approaching them for, for assistance. Um, I suppose it's an ill wind. They've now probably got a better idea of what the economy of Dumfries and Galloway looks like because they've had, uh, you know, upwards of two, three and a half, four thousand businesses contact them, giving them a, a good indication of what their, um, their, their health is, the, business, the health of the business, what the cash flow is like. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's, it's a bit bleaker than they, they maybe imagined. And there's a lot of businesses that have just been ticking over. A lot of businesses, even pre-COVID-19, were, were on the edge. Um, and, and it did certainly show that Dumfries and Galloway uh, and, and the, the, the wider south of Scotland needed something like uh, the enterprise company to, to keep these businesses going. The, the, the one criticism, uh, if I could have one uh, for the agency, was certainly the, the way they've handled uh, some of the applications. Uh, it's a very stressful, tense time for businesses who are uh, they've had their, their, their income com completely cut off and in, in many cases still had outgoings. Uh, it was a lot, sometimes applicants were having to wait quite a long time and the appeals process wasn't uh, clear initially. A little bit more transparency would have certainly uh, eased the, the pressure on some of these businesses. Uh, but we're starting to work through those. Uh, we're providing letters of support for, for some businesses that for one reason or another missed out. And at the moment, uh, we're, we're quite hopeful that some of these businesses that uh, were overlooked uh, for funding uh, when they're able to explain their cases a bit more clearly they are able to, to receive the funding that they so desperately need. If I can just uh, ask you a follow-up question just on the on the agency also we're talking about the new south of Scotland enterprise agency came into fruition on the uh, the first of April this year uh, so it has very much been a, a baptism of fire as you say for for them do you think they, they came in here slightly uh, underprepared? Because obviously they, they had that handover from the South of Scotland Economic Partnership, which was, I think for many people, despite the, uh, the marketing campaign, despite the effort they had uh, going out there, uh, businesses that we spoke to as the Chamber of Commerce uh, really were struggling to get their head around what so SEP was, and even pretty much just now, are actually struggling to, to get their head around what so SEA is actually going to be doing in the long term. Because many people have said, you know, it's going to be a Dumfries and Galloway version, the South of Scotland version of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. But it's not, it's, it's, it's got so much more expected of it uh, in its creation. 
Yeah, I, th I think if you look back in history, we had a South of Scotland enterprise company, which, um, you know, many benefited greatly from that. And I think we can look at the food and drink industry uh, right across Dumfries and Galloway. And, uh, you know, as, as the interventions at the South of Scotland enterprise company back then had, or sorry, don't beg your pardon, Dumfries and Galloway enterprise, I should say, uh, did result in, in some businesses that we see uh, today only being here because of that uh, Dumfries and Galloway enterprise, it lost its way when they, they nationalised it, if you like, and the decisions were taken at a, a, a central uh, level, which meant that they didn't look at what was best for Dumfries and Galloway, but they looked at what they thought was best for Scotland. And instead of getting businesses uh, relocating here, we had an agency that I, I, I feel worked against the efforts of uh, people like the Chamber to, to attract businesses. Uh, and we saw some businesses that would have uh, worked really well in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, moving to, to elsewhere because the funding was there for them to do that. Um, so I, I think expectations are high on the back of that. Uh, yep, I think they may be uh, somewhat uh, ill-prepared. Um, SOSEP didn't uh, lay out its stall very clearly to begin with. Uh, I raised concerns about the transparency of the application process. Um, they, they, they took a long time to get a website. They took a long time to get an email address. Um, so there was lots of issues uh, with SOSEP early on. I think they started to address that uh, at, at the end of their, uh, their, their time. But yeah, I think there's still a, a lack of understanding of uh, just exactly what um, SOSI uh, is going to do. Yeah, I, we would love it. To, to replicate lots of the good things that the Highlands and Islands have done. Um, I think you've only got to look at how Inverness has grown um, to be the successful large town uh, that it is uh, now and, and, and look at Dumfries and, 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 and consider perhaps if we'd had a, a more localised enterprise agency for longer, Dumfries might be in the same position that Inverness is now. So let's hope they can, they can, uh, they can get out there once we're uh, towards the end of COVID-19 and, and let businesses know exactly what they're there to do and, and support the whole economy. Uh, obviously, one of the things that uh, SOSIA have uh, funded came out earlier this week. Uh, they are uh, going to be supporting for the next five years the creation of a new uh, DMO uh, to take help tourism across the whole of the south of Scotland, obviously Scottish borders and Dumfries and Galloway, which I always thought was an interesting one because obviously uh, tourism and hospitality, key industries here in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, but we have seen, seen DMOs uh, tried before. Uh, Joan McAlpine came out with a very interesting statement. She said, uh, this investment is going to go a long way to help secure the tourism industry's future and vital jobs, which, which certainly raised my eyebrow finally, if you don't mind me saying this, because I'm thinking, is the creation of a DMO actually going to be helping or helpful for the, the hospitality and tourism businesses that are struggling just now across the south of Scotland? Is that where the, the, the agency should be putting their money, in a DMO? Yeah, well, we, we've, we've had DMOs in the past. We had Destination Dumfries and Galloway. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of the money for that organisation was ring-fenced and, and the members or, or, or stakeholders in Destination Dumfries and Galloway, um, I think, were, were misled as to what it could do. It, uh, to a huge extent, the, the money was ring-fenced to doing uh, market research and it was very much a business-to-business -business organization. So the, the public-facing side of the organization didn't do the promotional work that uh, some of its uh, members might have thought. The, the, the new, uh, if you like, DMO might address that. I do have concerns that uh, we are addressing this as a South of Scotland um, issue. I think the Scottish borders and Dumfries and Galloway, whilst they have a lot in common, they have a, a lot of differences and I would hate to think that we spend uh, too much money trying to make the south of Scotland as a whole a destination when Dumfries and Galloway is very unique, unique in its own rights as, as are, are the borders. So I hope we don't spend a million pounds trying to rebrand Dumfries and Galloway and rebrand the Scottish borders to, uh, to one um, uh, destination because I just can't see that working. Uh, we all know very much the differences, even in Dumfries and Galloway where we've got uh, the the, the visitor attractions that Dumfriesshire uh, it, it, it focused on and very much Burns country and whatever. And we've got Galloway, which uh, very much focuses on its beautiful beaches, the, the Galloway Forest Park and so on. So 
I think we've got to be very careful that we don't spend all the money uh, trying to rebrand or create a destination which doesn't exist at the moment at the expense of uh, two very well-known uh, areas. Um, one thing, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I assume you thought I would bring this up at some point, I would like to see some more work done on the potential for a Galloway National Park. Uh, we've done so much work and we've hit a, a, a barrier at the moment. Uh, I would like to, to think that uh, Kate Forbes, uh, our new finance minister, might be a little bit more open-minded than Derek Mackay was. And look at investing the, the maybe 50 or 60,000 pounds it would cost to do a proper feasibility study for, for a national park in the heart of Galloway. Um, and once and for all, uh, inform businesses and the public that uh, the, a national park can work, or maybe it can work. Um, but there's a lot of effort being put into it. It's, it's unfinished business, as my uh, late predecessor, Alec Ferguson, used to, to say. Um, and, and I think it's really important that that it's part of the work because there's no better brand in national park but we must be aware of the 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 the, the downsides of a national park as well as the positives and the way to do that is by carrying out a proper feasibility study and now there couldn't be a better time we really need to put uh, Dumfries and Galloway on the map uh, so let's do it now and and the uh, you know when we're getting through COVID-19 uh, and, and that might just be the short arm that we need uh, you mentioned the obviously the, the call for the Galloway National Park Chamber being very supportive of that in the past. Uh, we, we, we have we know we see the, the benefits that will come from that. As we look towards uh, Galloway, Wigtonshire in the west, there are some amazing, uh, amazing draws to, to that part of our great region. Uh, I'm thinking things like Wigtown Book Festival, I'm thinking Stranraer Oyster Festival, uh, Newton Stewart Mini Gaff Music, traditional music, all these great things that go on uh, to draw not only visitors from our own region but visitors from further afield uh, and one thing that has been striking me uh, during this whole situation that we are in just now has been the communication that has been going out for the past decade the past 15 years we've been here as Dumfries and Galloway saying uh, you know as, as you're driving up the the road from England turn left turn left and you will never want to leave we've got so much going on here but the message that's been going out uh, has been a little bit of a, a a slap in the face, should we say. Uh, you'll go to car parks, you'll go to different places, you will see these signs out there and it just says, Dumfries and Galloway closed to visitors. Uh, how hard is it going to be uh, to get that message changed when we come out of this? Because again, we're, we're hearing all the times from, from the First Minister, from, uh, from the Prime Minister, uh, staycation staycations are going to be the way to go and obviously here in Dumfries and Galloway so much to give in terms of a staycation uh, but uh, if you've been to Dumfries and Galloway if you've seen things just now that say close to visitors it doesn't give the most welcoming portrayal which we know is not true when you look at all the great hospitality tourism and leisure things that we have to offer yeah it is a very difficult situation it's getting the balance right there's still a lot of people out there who are very concerned uh, about COVID-19, particularly those who are, uh, you know, shielding or whatever. And, you know, social media is full of uh, people who are, who are genuinely scared that we're going to get an influx of visitors and with that would come an influx of uh, the virus. Uh, it's, it's all about common sense. Um, and I, I do, I, I don't often welcome uh, government announcements uh, and I have uh, had uh, concerns about some of them that have been made recently and the way that the uh, the COVID-19 crisis has been dealt with. However, you know, we've got this cluster in Gretna and Annan, um, and I think it's been a measured, very measured uh, approach. Uh, so we're not telling people who are coming to the self-catering businesses uh, and, and booked in for this weekend, and, and that's got to be welcomed. Uh, you know, Dumfries and Galloway's population uh, probably more than doubles uh, in, in some areas uh, when, we, when we get the, the tourists in. And we do have a huge number of uh, self-catering uh, accommodation. So I think the government got it right in this case. Uh, yep, the, the people in the postcode round it on Friesan and uh, Langham have got to be really careful for the next three or four days. They're not to travel more than five miles, but we can still welcome, the message is still there. We can welcome uh, visitors back into the region, but we want them to be sensible. And, you know, Dumfries and Galloway have got a fantastic sign out and it says, I think it says, be kind, please be aware of social distance. And that's really important. Um, let's not tell visitors not to come. Uh, let's welcome them as we, in, our, in our famous uh, Dumfries and Galloway welcome. 
uh, but make sure that uh, you know we still can be safe. And I know there's been a huge amount of work being done in, in Newton Stewart here to get the shops reopened, uh, looking at how the, the flow of uh, visitors and the pavements and the roads and whatever. So we, we must absolutely take away the signs to say Dumfries and Gallery is closed. But yeah, be kind, um, be uh, careful, and, and let's get the, the, the tourist economy, which is so important to this area, uh, back in its feet. All right, Finlay, we've got some uh, questions coming in thick and fast just now. If it's all right, I'm going to just uh, break into some of them just now and we'll just continue the conversation uh, as it goes along. We've had one come in from uh, Andrew Cairns uh, from Murray Farm Care. He says, uh, Lee, the lockdown has meant that uh, I have been working extensively from home in Isle Steps, which is about uh, a mile and a half to two miles from Dumfries Town Boundary. The broadband speed is poor and inadequate for normal business remote working. It's slow and it's unpredictable. Does Finland have any ideas when we might expect that situation to improve? Because obviously my approaches to broadband providers have been unfruitful and working from home, the way it's going to be likely going to become more frequent in the future. Now, Finlay, I know uh, this is something that you've been very passionate about in the past. You've, you, you've been involved with in digital connectivity your whole life. Uh, and I think this is all the more important, as Andrew says, because we are going to be working from home, adapting to this new normal. But also earlier this week, there was uh, questions being raised about whether R100 is actually going to uh, meet its plans on time. Can you shed any light on digital connectivity in the region yeah well certainly you know you touched on r100 now one of the first arguments when people will say well wait a minute this is not the scottish government's responsibility it's westminster's responsibility telecommunications a reserved issue uh, and yeah it is um policy making on on uh, telecommunications as our legislation is reserved to westminster however the the practical on the ground delivery is uh, the responsibility of the devolved nations um, so absolutely, R100 is the Scottish Government's uh, flagship policy to, to deliver super fast broadband to every single premises in Scotland. And that was supposed to be delivered, or it was, the commitment was to make to deliver that by the end of 21. Uh, and we're going to miss that. We know, we know that already. Uh, we're fortunate in the south of Scotland, as one of the, the three lots there is, that uh, we have got our main contractor, that's uh, Openreach. Whereas in the Highlands and Islands, uh, the, there's a contractual uh, fight going on and it, it may be that R100 can't be delivered in that part of Scotland at all. Um, I've, I've, I've had an ongoing battle with Paul Wheelhouse to be open and honest about uh, how R100 is progressing and, and give him his due, he's, he's tried to be open about it. However, we were, we, given, we were given a commitment back in January that there would be a detailed plan, a premises by premises plan to show uh, when the rollout would, would arrive. So whether you lived in Twynham or Borg or uh, uh, Isle Steps or whatever, by the summer, this summer, you would be able to have a date of when to expect super fast broadband. Now, I welcomed that because it brought some, uh, you know, certainty about for businesses moving forward. I've still got uh, constituent businesses who are investing tens of thousands of pounds to put in lease lines themselves. Well, nobody's wanting to invest tens of thousands of pounds if they know that super fast broadband is going to be delivered uh, in, in months or, or weeks. My understanding is that the R100 project in the south of Scotland will commence uh, in July. Uh, we're into July now. I don't know whether that's been the case, but certainly it's very disappointing to see that we still don't have this detailed route map, if you like, of where we're going to get uh, the, the, the fibre, which in, in most cases it will be fibre to the premises, uh, delivered. And we're continuing to put pressure on the Scottish Government to do that. Um, Openreach uh, have been uh, open with us. They, they, they've told us that the progress really hasn't been slowed down by uh, COVID-19 because much of the work they have to do is desktop exercise uh, to look at the, the most efficient and, and the, the quickest way to, to roll out the fibre. So there should be no excuses that uh, COVID-19 has delayed this. Uh, when we're now seeing people back to work, uh, the, the government really have to publish this and give some certainty to businesses because down here, it's not necessarily the speed, it's the reliability and being able to depend on the connection. We don't actually need 300 meg, we don't actually need 60 meg. What we need is a, a, a strong, uh, constant, uh, reliable service, and, and that's what we've been calling on for so long. So let's hope that Paul Wheelhouse can deliver. Fergus Ewan said he would resign if it wasn't delivered by 2021. I'm still waiting to see his letter, uh, but hopefully Paul Wheelhouse can, can deliver, um, but I'm not going to hold my breath.
Uh, just on the, the another thing that came out, uh, I think it might have just been before Christmas, uh, and I know it's something that you have been vocal about and in, in, in helping for and push for in the past, was the creation of that uh, the single rural network, which was obviously going to be to, to increase a mobile phone, a, a mobile broadband connectivity uh, across Dumfries and Galloway, and, and we were uh, in, in line to be one of these uh, 5G pilots programs. Uh, it seems to have gone certainly publicly very quiet on this and I know there's some parts of the region let's hands up let's be fair are still struggling to get uh, a good 3G signal let alone a 5G one. Uh, just while we're talking about digital connectivity can you shed any light on on where we are with that or have you heard any information that you might be willing to share at this time? Uh, I'm not uh, aware of, of any accelerated uh, program. We did see uh, an increase in mobile coverage on the back of the emergency services network. Uh, EE rolled out to ensure that every road in the region would have connectivity at some point. And that's, that's brought great benefits to some people. Um, so in some areas where uh, this poor copper wire, which uh, the fixed line broadband has been very, very poor, they've been able to connect to, to the 4G network, uh, giving speeds of up to to 40 meg in some cases, which has been a, a great boost. There is an infill program um, that we'll, we'll look at in, increasing these 4G towers. Uh, 5G, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's a different technology. It doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna have faster uh, speeds or more reliable speeds. It's just a, it's, it's a way of connecting networks, as, as you say. Where I see the biggest benefit that coming from is a, in agriculture. Uh, and, and where we need monitoring and so on, or, or even flood risks or whatever. So that's going to be a, a, a great boost. Uh, what I've done uh, in the last uh, two or three weeks uh, is try to set up a digital task force, uh, bringing in the, the, the college. Uh, a BT have, have also uh, played a role in it. Uh, and in the next uh, couple of weeks, we're going to have a meeting with uh, SOSI, the college, uh, some uh, employers, uh, to look at just exactly what we need in terms of digital in Dumfries and Galloway. As you said, there's lots more people working from home uh, and, and there's people who unfortunately are not going to be going back to work anytime soon because the businesses that they were working for are, are still not op able to operate or they haven't survived this crisis. Uh, so we need to look at uh, an acceleration in digital training to make sure that uh, we've got people doing the jobs that we need uh, and they, they're able to do that from home. So hopefully over the next few weeks, um, this digital task force will, will help pull it all together so we'll get businesses and we'll get uh, a further education looking at uh, the skills that we need uh, over not just the next year but over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So I'm very positive Dumfries and Galloway uh, can be a fantastic test bed for the likes of 5G technology, internet of things as we call it. Uh, for lots of different reasons we've got a, a, an elderly population uh, where we have organisations like Care Call uh, and, and massive innovation when it comes to looking after people at home uh, predicting falls and, and, and so on. Uh, so there, there is business opportunities in providing uh, that sort of technology and uh, hopefully this task force can give us a direction, uh, a, a travel that everybody can uh, get involved with and, and, and reap some rewards. Okay, the next question we have uh, comes in from uh, Fiona Milligan. She says, uh, Finn, do you think the Dumfries and Galloway Council can move quickly enough and make sufficient change to meet climate change commitments? And you did touch on, and this, this would be a great time to do it earlier on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, firstly, can I put on record, I think Dumfries and Galloway Council have uh, reacted to this virus incredibly well. Uh, it's, you know, we've already got councils that are under huge uh, financial pressures. Uh, and, and they really did uh, turn the, the, the council around to, to address the, the issues that were, were most pressing and, and the, the, the staff and the council have done a fantastic job. Uh, when it comes to, to the green credentials, uh, we've got a dreadful record. Uh, I've got to say that when it comes to recycling, uh, our recycling levels are, are the lowest in the country. And I know the council will, will argue that that's because we, we deal with our refuge in a different way. But we've seen a disastrous rollout of a curbside recycling in Wigtonshire, uh, which was paused because it costs substantially more. Uh, and we lost millions of pounds as a result. Uh, you know, all the money that was supposed to be spent in Dumfries and Galloway uh, was spent in, in the Wigtonshire region. And, and we're, we're doing a U-turn on that. So the, the, the recycling, curbside recycling that was rolled out uh, two or three years ago is going to stop and we're going to bring in an another system. Um, we need to make sure we get it right this time. 
Uh, we have got uh, lots of different things coming up. Uh, recently in Parliament, we passed a, a, an instrument which allowed the introduction of a DRS system, the deposit return systems for, for uh, drink containers. That's going to make a big difference to the, the quality of uh, rubbish, if you like, that we, we present uh, on, on the curbside for the council to take away, which will uh, bring added uh, financial pressures because there is value and, and what we throw away, but a lot of that value is in, in plastic bottles and aluminium cans, which will no longer uh, play uh, a part in the, the curbside recycling. Um, we need to ramp it up. Uh, you know, Lee, before we came on air, we, we talked about uh, how seven weeks is habit forming, and we all, once we, we've over the seven week mark, it's, it's far easier to, to carry on in the way we have. I, I worry that uh, we are going to return to our bad old ways if we don't get action taken now. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to sit in the climate, uh, the, the cross party climate uh, stakeholders working group with the, the cabinet secretary, and we're looking at uh, what they can do now to allow us to move uh, faster and how to, to go further in tackling the climate change. And local authorities have a huge role to play in that. Uh, I would like to think that they can uh, roll out the, the recycling uh, sooner rather than later so we do get into good habits. We've been very careful here and what we've been throwing away because our bins uh, now don't get collected so often. And, and we had a fantastic pilot project in Wigtonshire uh, where the, the, the separate bins really did make you think about what you were throwing away and, and how, what you could reuse and, and so on. We need to keep that going. Um, when it comes to the capacity, well, we, we have a new climate change a councillor who, who's looking after that. So, and we've got Southern written into policy that it's always got to be um, part of the considerations when any new policies are brought in. So yeah, that's really important. Um, but we do need uh, a sense of direction uh, from, from the, the Scottish government and their, their green, green recovery, recovery plan. Well, we'll hopefully address that, but it's going to cost money. Um, and, and that's not just public purse money. It's also going to, uh, we're going to have to expect businesses to invest in it because uh, you know, if we, if we don't look after our climate, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be in big trouble. All right, the next question, uh, thank you very much for that one, comes in from John Palmer. He says, uh, Lee, earlier this week, we heard the UK government announce plans for a major investment in the rail sector with plans to reopen up to 50 disused railway lines and stations. Uh, there has been increased talk in the past six months about the proposed instalment or reinstallment of the Dumfries to Stranraer railway line. Not only would this allow for rail travel from one end of the new agency's patch to the other, but would also mirror moves seen in the Scottish borders and the borderlands growth area with a promise of investment and upgrading of the rail network in Carlisle. It would also allow for increased job opportunities due to the ease of travel as well as easing traffic on the main Euro route to Cairn Ryan. Uh, Finlay, have you heard anything about this proposal and would you be supporting it? So I suppose, would you be supporting the reinstallation uh, of the Dumfries to Stranraer train line and, and any benefits that came with it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm all for improving rail services. We we don't have a fantastic rail service in Dumfries and Galloway. The services from Dumfries are, are not ideal and from Sonar they're few and far between and uh, you know the, the, it's not ideal. We have a station uh, which sits well out of the town on the end of a pier. It's not the most uh, welcoming uh, site on a, on a, I was going to say a wet uh, October night but even a a wet July morning. Uh, so that there's lots we can do there. And, and I have lobbied uh, ScotRail and a, a, the ScotRail Alliance to look at uh, potentially creating another station in Sunrar to, to encourage more visitors. And when it comes to the Dumfries to Sunrar railway line, absolutely. If, if it was something that uh, was feasible, I would welcome it. Of, of course, we would have one of the most beautiful uh, railway lines uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, my issue with it, if you like, is that most of the line has now disappeared. It's a completely different level of investment than, say, the, the, the Scottish borders, uh, the, the borders railway, where most of the line was still intact or the, the infrastructure around the line. When you look at the, the railway line between uh, Dumfries and Sunrar, there's no stations left. The, the, the platforms in Castle Douglas or Kakubri or uh, whatever are, are, are all long gone. The, the level of investment to bring back that railway line would be uh, eye-watering. Uh, having said that, the government have now got to uh, keep an eye on 
uh, where they invest their money and they've got to look at the, the, the carbon cost, if you like, of installing uh, railway lines as opposed to roads and so on, or rail travel. I would love to see less low than 75. Um, it's, it's, it's got uh, more uh, HGVs than any compatible road uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, it's, it's a blight on our, our daily lives, particularly in villages like Springholm and Crockett Ford. Um, we, we, we need something drastically uh, you know, different. It's not, it's not acceptable that we, we've got to live with that now. If we look at it in the long term, uh, you know, we've had suggestions that the, the UK government uh, might be able to invest in some infrastructure programmes uh, in Scotland. And uh, the Prime Minister said that we needed to look at uh, investing in the union. I've written to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, to pr promote uh, the, the A75 as, as one of the most important routes in, in the UK. It connects uh, the Northern Powerhouse, Scotland uh, to, to Northern Ireland and ultimately into the Republic, which will be our only uh, road link, if you like, uh, into, into Europe. So the A75 is incredibly important. And if, if we want to have a, a quick hit, the, the railway line is a long, long term investment and, and potentially unfeasible just with the, given the costs involved. Uh, but we, we could see some uh, improvements to the A75, which would make a massive difference. We did have a commitment from the Scottish Government when Stena moved out to Cairn Ryan to invest in the road, and that just hasn't come forward. Uh, we only get 0.5% of the national infrastructure spent in the south of Scotland. That really needs to change. Uh, the, the Scottish Government need to, to realise the importance of that link and the importance of the economy uh, of Dumfries and Galloway could be to Scotland if they actually had the investment that we need. It'll be interesting one to, to keep an eye on. Most definitely does it need that improvement on that road link. Uh, let's try this. Uh, Stephen Montgomery has got some questions. Uh, Stephen, good morning. How are you? What's your questions for Finlay? Good morning, Lee. Good morning, Finlay. How are you? Uh, nice to have um, share the, the webinar with you this morning. Um, obviously, uh, my name is Stephen Montgomery. I've got the Pinehead Hotel in Lockerbie, Charlie Harvest, and Dumfries, and another business in, in Lockerbie as well. I'm also the president for the Scottish License Trade Association now. We represent uh, all the pubs, clubs, hotels and restaurants throughout Scotland. So at the moment, you can imagine how difficult my job is and one of the guys in the office. Also sit on the, the Scottish Tourism Task Force, which has been uh, built by Jamie Hepburn and Fergus Ewing. Um, so again, you can imagine the, the scope of work that we're undertaking there. And I, I talked about, you know, we said earlier on about uh, 12 months for recovery. Uh, we're looking at 18 to 24 months for recovery in tourism. And Dumfries and Galloway, uh, you know, has a fantastic area for tourism. And as Lee said earlier on, it's been my thing for years uh, with living in Lockerbie that, you know, Scotland doesn't just start at Gretna and go north, it goes left. And it's been a massive thing to try and get people to go left. Um, albeit, I'd probably miss out in Lockerbie, but however, it's very, very important that the people up the, that coast and that side of Scotland get the tourism that, that it needs. And it's got so much welcoming there uh, that probably people that live in that part of Scotland don't even realise that we have ourselves. Um, but the hospitality sector in particular, we uh, need very, very much so ongoing support. You know, we're, we've got people with uh, readable values over 51,000 that haven't got a penny. Um, you know, and I've had argument and argument with Kate Forbes over this. I've had arguments with uh, Fiona Hislip over this. I've had arguments with uh, Fergus Ewing and getting nowhere. The same thing comes back where it's not our problem, it's the UK government. Well, I'm very, very sorry, but you know, at the end of the day, Scottish government, and taking politics out of this completely, Scottish government have got the, the right to distribute the Barnet consequentials in a way that they feel necessary throughout the grant system. And they have totally ignored the people at 51,000 and above. Um, you know, we've had people in, in Dumfries and Galway that have really, really suffered with that. Which brings me on to the perf. Then, you know, only 10 to 14% of people in the hospitality sector that applied for the PERF Pivotal or Hardship Funds actually were accepted, which is an absolute, another kick in the teeth to a, a business or a sector that are taxed, that are rated, you know, 30% in the rest of our, uh, more than the rest of our colleagues in England uh, and the rest of the UK. Customer confidence at the moment is really, really low. And I had an hour and a half conversation with the First Minister last week. Um, and I'll be quite blunt, I did pull her up uh, on her, um, voices the other day whenever she didn't open for beer gardens where she said that uh, hospitality and beer gardens or pubs, clubs, hotels and gyms were hot spots. Now, we already had Mr Blackford pulled up for his tweet uh, on you know, the sky, Scotland being closed etc. Now 
she can't keep using the word hot pot because customer confidence is low. We know that that was probably a medical term, but customers don't know that. So we've asked her, and we need to get MSPs and everybody to out a positive um, word that, you know, we will welcome people back. We want you back into Scotland. But that then moves on to the community thing, where communities um, are very, very scared of uh, people coming in from, you know, as we know, Cumbria at the moment is a is a, an area which we've got an issue with, and and uh, and then obviously in, in Annan, which hopefully will be cured by Monday. But we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, and we're very vocal at the minute with discouraging people going from Dumfries, Annan, and Lockerbie and everything down to Carlisle this weekend when the beer 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 pubs open. Um, we've been very focal on that. So there is a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Um, you know, the community issues is a big one and the hotspots. But personally, you know, I would welcome um, more offline uh, conversations with Finley. And just whenever you're talking about the, uh, the DRS, you know, we sit on that as well on the advisory one, the Scottish License Trade Association. And this mm -hmm. is going to be, a, I know we've got maybe a, a wee bit uh, of leniency in this, but this is going to be an absolute nightmare for us. I welcome it and the association welcomes it to a degree. But um, you know yourself the ins and outs of it by putting back and forth the 20p for anybody that comes in, all this kind of stuff. On a busy Saturday night, that will be an absolute nightmare for us whilst we already control our own waste. A75, uh, Finlay, um, versus the railway. I would absolutely welcome money being invested into the A75 to make it a dual carriageway um, rather than a railway um, you know, going up through because the A75 has been the bane of our life for long enough and it would welcome people through. It's the only route I think in Europe that doesn't have a, a dual carriageway to a port. Um, you know, so investment into that would be much, much uh, welcomed as well. But I'd welcome your, your feedback on, on what I've just said. Stephen, thank you very much for those. Yeah, some some great comments there. Finlay, I've, I've noticed you've been taking uh, notes galore during that. So, uh, so yeah, what would you like to say to Stephen on those marks? Well, certainly, I, I don't know whether there's any relation, but uh, I used to farm right next to the 75 in a really bad corners at Twynham, and, and Montgomery's uh, lorries used to visit us quite regularly, uh, uninvited, and, and they really didn't want to stay for very long, but uh, we had uh, we had our share of uh, loot, if you like, from the back of Montgomery's lorries, but uh, maybe no relation at all. Um, but certainly, um, the A75, um, it's, it's, it's not a long route, as you, if, if you've picked up. We've got uh, routes from the main artery uh, motorways in uh, south of the border to Haysham, and to Holyhead that have all been duelled uh, and they're about 40, 50 miles, uh, you know, and, and well more than that. I think that, I think the Haysham route's about 17 miles of dual carriageway, which would bring it in line with A75. Um, as I say, we had the commitment uh, that there was going to be more overtaking opportunities and whatever when Stena invested heavily in, in Kay and Ryan. That's just not happened. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a difficult route to, to duel. Uh, what we need to do is pick out the, the areas that need it most and prioritise it. We're not looking for it to be done overnight. It's, a, it's going to be a long-term project, but there's, there's areas, uh, for example, at, uh, between Gatehouse of Fleet and, and Creetown, which are particularly uh, poor, uh, you know, and, and areas between, um, you know, Kirkcoan, Rodend and whatever, where the, the road is atrocious. It's getting narrower uh, by the year as the verges encroach on the, the road and, and the vegetation, the trees, uh, meet in the middle in some areas. So yeah, it's the underinvestment is, is quite eye-watering. So I would back and I, hopefully um, we can uh, can see some of this money that's going to be invested in, in the union. Uh, what better way than uh, to link in Northern England, uh, Scotland and, and Ireland uh, by by uh, building a, a better road. I know we've talked about the Boris Bridge and, and people say that's pie in the sky. Uh, the, very, uh, the very fact that they're talking about how important A75 is, is good enough for me. And, and let's hope we do see some investment in that. And if it's going to be from the UK government rather than the Scottish government, I'll welcome that. Uh, any investment, whether it, wherever it comes from, um, I'm all for. Uh, you touched on DRS. <laughs> We've had some real issues uh, in committee with DRS. We, we don't believe that uh, passing the regulations uh, a, a few months ago uh, was the right thing to do. Uh, that, as you say, it's, it could be 18, 24 months before uh, the tourism or, or the hospitality sector get back uh, into, into profit. I was about to say back to normal. I don't know whether that'll ever happen again. I think we'll, we'll have a new normal. Uh, so to bring in regulations on a deposit return scheme where the, the environment where that will be operating could be completely and utterly different 
Uh, we've also got no infrastructure to deal with the, the bottles and cans uh, that, that this system uh, collects at the moment. So uh, we, not only do we have to build the infrastructure and make sure it's in the right place, uh, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that the hotels, uh, takeaways, outlets, online sales can all be dealt with without a detriment to, to the businesses. My biggest concern with DRS is that it's not a UK wide system. So we're going to have uh, potentially bottles that are bought in Carlisle or uh, in, in Asda uh, when people go, go for their booze cruises to save the five or 10 pence uh, that the minimum pricing uh, has brought in. Uh, but we will also uh, could potentially um, stop some of our smaller breweries. Uh, we, and we're very lucky to have uh, three or four uh, uh, well-known breweries in, in Dumfries and Galloway. They will have to put labelling on their bottle, uh, which identifies them as being part of the Scottish Deposit Return Scheme. But uh, they'll not be able to sell those south of the border because if they're sold south of the border, they can't be deposited uh, back here. Uh, so there's potential for fraud or whatever. I would rather that we looked at uh, delaying until we had a UK-wide uh, scheme. Uh, and other nations, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, have decided that uh, it would be uh, it would be bad for business. It would be bring a, a huge initial cost, but ultimately a, a UK-wide scheme is the one that's going to work most effectively. Um, uh, the, the pivotal grants, yeah, I, I take on board that, and we did we did lobby Kate Forbes uh, and the Scottish government uh, around the 51k. Absolutely appreciate that. Uh, the rateable values uh, in comparison to elsewhere in the UK are, are substantially higher. So some businesses that uh, are in the 51k up here wouldn't be in that bracket uh, south of the border and would have attracted funding. A little bit more flexibility uh, was what I hoped for in the, the pivotal uh, grant scheme to identify those businesses. Um, again, South of Scotland Enterprise Agency uh, identified some of the key businesses in the area uh, I don't know how that was done. Uh, that'll hopefully come out in the future, uh, sooner rather than later, to see exactly what they thought the, the most important businesses were uh, and, and why some have been excluded. Uh, we're still dealing with this. I'm, I'm hoping that we're, we're hearing all these grant uh, schemes where we're coming to an end. It, they can't come to an end. There's businesses that still need support. Some businesses have missed out for, for various reasons, and, and I would like to see some sort of um, sweep up grant system where we have uh, people with a local knowledge can actually uh, understand how important these businesses are uh, because the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency, a bit like Highlands and Islands, is there about the socio-economic value as well as just the, 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 the hard uh, graph to, to increase the GDP of the nation. So it's about making sure communities are resilient. So the, the little corner shop, which uh, maybe doesn't look grand on the big scale of, uh, you know, paying taxes or employing lots of people, is absolutely critical to, to a community. So I, I would like to see the introduction of, a, a, I feel like, a sweep up um, support scheme that will look at some of these businesses that had been uh, missed out with a far more uh, local uh, focus on and the, the benefits they bring to the whole economy. Stephen, thank you very much for, for those questions. I'm sure Finlay will uh, be in contact and have a conversation with you again offline about some of your other concerns. Uh, we, we mentioned the creation of the, the DMO earlier, Finlay. Uh, how important a role is Visit Scotland actually going to have in the recovery of, of well, the, where we are just now? Uh, well, you know, I think things, things have changed now. I think Visit Scotland's role is to, to, to promote the whole of Scotland as a destination to, to, to get people to initially think about coming to Scotland in the first place. Uh, it, it doesn't really do a particularly good job in advertising areas within Scotland. Uh, well, it, it probably does a very good job of uh, attracting people to Edinburgh, uh, which I don't know that's uh, it, it's particularly significant to Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, Edinburgh can promote itself without intervention from, from the, the national body. Uh, I think Visit Scotland need to uh, give the new DMO a uh, room and allow the stakeholders to uh, uh, play a far bigger role than they have in the, in the past in, in highlighting the, the benefits we've got in Dumfries and Galloway. We've got some fantastic businesses, we've got a, a fantastic environment uh, and, and those need to be seen uh, as, as the driving force to bring people here. I don't know what role Visit Scotland has 
in promoting Dufferis and Galloway uh, over and above promoting Scotland. And on that basis, they need to ensure this organisation has the, the decision-making powers and the budget to promote Dufferis and Galloway the way it deserves. Um, again, we've, we've had stakeholder groups in the past, Destination Dufferis and Galloway, which, you know, I, I argue it actually did what it set out to do. We've, we've got lots of fantastic information about where our visitors are coming from uh, and, and what the spend is and what the profile of visitors. And that was an exercise we really had to do. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go through all that again because we're probably not going to see the, the busloads of uh, retired people, the saga holidays coming anytime soon uh, with our, our more elderly and our population being very, very aware of social distancing and shielding. Um, we've got a fantastic product in, uh, in our self-catering. We, we do incredibly well with self-catering here. We've got some fantastic holiday parks uh, along our coast, which are, are you know, they're, they're five-star uh, uh, holiday destinations. We maybe need to do a lot more in, in promoting uh, those types of holidays. Uh, so I think our, our, our marketplace is going to change. Uh, we're not going to see the busloads of, of older people turning up at a hotel uh, and doing the coach tour type, uh, type uh, visits anytime soon. Uh, so we need th this organisation to help the hotels that uh, depend on that sort of business and, and make sure they can change and evolve uh, to address the, the, the changes in their, uh, you know, the, the market that's available to them. All right, Finlay, we've got uh, <clears throat> sorry, just time for a, for one more question, I think, on this. Uh, and it comes in from uh, Graham Galloway. Uh, Graham, the, of course, uh, project manager for developing the young workforce here in Dumfries and Galloway. He says, uh, Finlay, the advisory group on economic recovery for 2020, the Benny Higgins report, was published 10 days ago. Its uh, recommendations included targeted funding support for the introduction of a Scottish jobs guarantee scheme to offer secure employment for at least two years to all 16 to 25 year olds. Is this something that you would support and how would you see this working in practice? Yeah, well, at, at the moment, uh, we, we've got a real issue with uh, youth unemployment in Dumfries and Galloway. <clears throat> uh, again, we're going to have to start from a, a, a clean sheet of paper because the, the jobs that are available or the opportunities going forward are going to be considerably different than what they are uh, have been in the past. Uh, the Scottish Conservatives backed a, a policy, Ruth Davidson, uh, at the, our conference, I think it was three years ago, uh, uh, backed every single young person leaving school either to go into work or full-time education. Uh, this uh, could, could be a, a way to, to ensure that. Uh, and, and the discussions we had uh, last week in the climate change, uh, it was something we were raised with uh, Rosanna Cunningham. There, there's absolutely jobs when it comes to uh, uh, climate change, uh, whether that's peat restoration, whether that's uh, more forestry. We've got some fa fantastic uh, renewable energy companies in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, I know uh, you, you, Graham will be aware that I was very keen uh, to, to get a, a renewable energy uh, forum up and running, uh, which looked specifically at the, the training, the sort of uh, people that we need in the future. Uh, too many of our, uh, our, our employ employees in our renewable sector at the moment come from out with the region, they're trained out with the region and come in. I would like to see uh, our secondary schools uh, with, with uh, apprenticeship courses uh, and so on to, to ensure that we have young people uh, able to step into the, to the jobs that Dumfries and Galloway uh, are, are, are going to be develop, developing in the future and that's very much around uh, you know our environment, our, our climate and, and uh, making the most of that and that's whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in uh, climate change mitigation or uh, adaptation or uh, renewables. Uh, the food and drink industry is another uh, strong point we've got in Dumfries and Galloway. But also, and, and again, we talked, we touched on this, there's far more people working from home. Where else could be nicer to work from home than in, in Dumfries and Galloway? So we need to get the digital resources uh, right, the digital training, so that people can come and live in our, our more uh, rural areas uh, and, and do the jobs they would be doing in cities. So we, we need to have a, a, a whole new look at uh, how we're educating our young people to ensure they can do the jobs that we need in the future. Uh, two years uh, guaranteed employment, uh, as, as long as that's uh, pushed into the, uh, the, the sectors that we need. And again, we've been over that. So yeah, I, I would welcome something that would, would ensure that we had uh, job creating uh, opportunities in the future. And there's uh, one final question just came in here on the uh, 
on the emails. Uh, and if you do still have any questions you, you would like Finlay asked, you can email them to me, lee.med at dgchamber.co.uk, and we will forward them on. Uh, this one comes into us from uh, Kirsty Aitken. Kirsty, of course, uh, business development manager for, for Robinsons uh, out in Lockerbie. She says, Lee, uh, I've been in meetings with other councils this week who have detailed plans for investment projects in their own local areas that will be procured locally and in a way that will open jobs and apprenticeships in the area. Do you think, uh, or is Finlay aware, of anything similar in Dumfries and Galloway? So it's, I suppose it's about uh, local government investment and local procurement taking place in D&G, which is something that many businesses have said in the past. They'd love to be involved in procurement, but a lot of the, the, the things that come to Dumfries and Galloway are just too big for many of the businesses here. Yeah, uh, we'll probably not go into too much uh, detail when it comes to procurement in Dumfries and Galloway Council right at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we're not going to touch on that topic. There's a, there's a lot of tidying up to do there before we we can move forward. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not aware of any specific schemes within uh, Dumfries and Galloway. However, I know that uh, we have only spent something, and, and, and I may be, it may not be spot on now, but between 70 and 75% of the total pot we could possibly draw down uh, on the, the non-domestic rates funding. So we, we, we're we still, uh, we've got some money there available that was ring-fenced, if you like, for Dumfries and Galloway for, for some grant schemes. I would like uh, to think that the, the, the council, uh, along with the Scottish government, to, can look at that money and reinvest it in that sort of thing. Um, so that money, if, we, if every single business that was eligible for NDR uh, grants had claimed it, uh, we would have 25% more funding, if, if you like. Rather than that funding remain with the Scottish government, I would like the council to, to uh, look at how they can pull that money down and another grant scheme uh, which would help with procurement. You know, one, one of the things I'm passionate about is, is local procurement. Um, we have got a fantastic food and drink industry in this area. We've got, we, we're still the, the milk fields of, uh, uh, of the UK. We've got some of the, the, uh, the most efficient dairy farms. Uh, we, we have a, a huge lack of food processing if, uh, capacity, whether that's in meat or whether it's in, in dairy products. So, yeah, when it comes to local procurement, the first thing we need to do is, is make sure we get the the whole um, chain right. Uh, we, we don't have uh, processing capacity. That's something we need to look at if we, if we want to uh, be serious about uh, procurement when it comes to uh, local authorities, health board and whatever, when it comes to local produce. Uh, yeah, we, we should be bold. We should be far more ambitious. Uh, I would like to think the Borderlands was a platform to do that and certainly we're uh, so Now, there should be no barriers to us uh, looking for uh, the, the biggest investments. Uh, you know, Tesla are looking for a new plant to build batteries somewhere in the UK. Well, why don't uh, we look at that? Uh, why don't we uh, sell Dumfries and Galloway and we've got a site at Chapel Cross? I know there's, there's things that are earmarked for that. Uh, but let's, let's be bold. Let's be the ones that actually say, well, wait a minute. Let's think out the box a little bit. Um, we've got a fantastic location. We've got the renewable potential uh, far more than we, we, we can't consume anything like the, the power that we, we generate here. We've got a skilled workforce. Um, let's let's look at, at bringing in some of these big names and, and hopefully with Borderlands and uh, Soci now, there's not going to be that desire to have it somewhere in the central belt. And it's actually all about developing the economy in the south of Scotland. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope that the council can get some of that money to look at how they can uh, be a little bit more innovative and a little bit uh, bolder and a little bit braver when it comes to uh, attracting inward investment. Finlay, thank you so, so much for taking the time today. Uh, that is it for this one, the first of our virtual business breakfasts. And so with the Dumfries and Galloway Chamber of Commerce, more of these in the coming weeks. Uh, but Finlay, as it stands just now, thank you for taking the time. And before we go, uh, from all of us here at DG Chamber, thank you very much. But also congratulations uh, due to yourself, yourself and uh, partner Jackie. Recently, like, you're going to be getting married later this year. And of course, a uh, second child on the way as well. So from all of us to all of you, uh, a very warm congratulations. And we look forward to uh, catching up with you very, very soon. Thank you very much. Finley Carson, MSP. Thank you.